Jacqueline Coley, awards editor at Rotten Tomatoes, and I'm your host for today's half hour with Bobby Wine, the People's President. I'm joined today by the Academy-nominated filmmakers behind the film. We have Christopher Sharp and Moses Buayo. I think the most important part of this documentary is how it sort of began. And so Christopher, I'd love for you to go ahead and start with, first of all, how the project came about and what folks have in store for when they actually now can finally view this documentary at home. Great, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us, it's absolutely fantastic. So I actually grew up in Uganda and my father was also grew up in Uganda and spent his whole life there. So I had a big connection to it. Um, when I first met Bobby and Barbie in 2017, I was just completely astounded by them. I couldn't believe that such incredible people existed. So what had happened to Bobby, he'd grown up in the ghetto, and you'll see all this in the film. He'd grown up in the ghetto, quite a tough life. Um, he lost his parents relatively early, so he very much had to look after himself. He had lots of brothers, siblings, he had lots of siblings, but basically he was a guy growing up in the ghetto. He, he had been incredibly successful with his music and through his music, he had managed to put himself through university where he did drama and music. And while he was at university, he met his wife-to-be Barbie. And the story basically takes you through all of that. And then it shows how he sets himself up for this amazing life with this wonderful wife, these four beautiful children, this incredibly successful music career. And just when you think, you know, he's got everything, he decides to start singing protest songs against the government. And the government obviously doesn't like this. They get extremely upset. And they understand that he is a credible opposition to him because he has this amazing connection with the people, mainly through his music. And then we watch him as he grows politically and becomes more of a threat to the government. He becomes an independent member of parliament for an area in Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda. And then eventually he runs against the regime who have been in power for 38, well, at that point, 34 years. And he runs against them in an election. The election is a sham. Um, it's something they do every five years. It's a way of consolidating power and make it look like it's some sort of democracy. Bobby goes into the election knowing that it's a sham, but he still wants to prove that people oppose the government. And he does this at great, great physical cost to him and his wife and financial cost to him and his wife. And you just see two incredibly brave people risking everything for what they believe in. Yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at the trailer for Bobby Wine, the People's President. This is a message to the government. I met Bobby at university. I didn't know he was a musician. He was different. I didn't have so many dreams. She impacted my life. She made me realize we had to impact other lives. I've come to parliament and taken an oath to protect the constitution of Uganda. Somebody had to speak for us. People thought I had the loudest voice. Again, one more confident time. This year's presidential election could see 71-year-old President Museveni serve a fifth term in office. No leader has ever handed over power peacefully. This is a military regime dressed in a civil facade. We have the Honorable Bobby Wine with us. As a matter of fact, I will <laughs> Why is my husband held in a military barracks? If I could see him, then I would know what I am actually dealing with. Our Bobby should be the least. rather represent the resilience of Ugandans. We stand for equality and dignity for everybody. We are 
non-violent, and we continue to preach non-violence. Nothing will stop him. We must get our freedom or we shall die trying. We are fighting for freedom. We are fighting for freedom. Uh, Moses, I'd love for you to talk about your in, your sort of intersection with him as both, whether I'm sure maybe the first time you interacted with him was as a musician, but when was the first time you really saw Bobby the politician that we get to know in this documentary? Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, the, well, um, I met Bobby through uh, Christopher, but actually the very first moment I met him was uh, at a screening of uh, a film, Queen of Katwe, in which he his music is is uh, features, um, but to meet him, the Bobby today, the the politician, uh, Christopher reached out through a friend, and he was putting together a team in Uganda to work on the documentary. And Chris, you know, Crystal said he was born in Uganda, and I was like, oh my god, like this guy was born in Uganda, and I'm like, where? And he told me about uh, the the village where he was born, where his his father, uh, his grandfather set up a hospital. Actually, that's the same hospital where Bobby, Bobby's wife was born. Um, anyway, so around the time when Christopher reached out, Bobby was asking a whole population to get involved in politics, you know, um, in, in the Museveni regime in the past uh, uh, 38 years, every election cycle is, you, you know, people get ready for violence because they know um, every election, you know, people are killed, people are kidnapped. But for the first time, Bobby was asking us, the youth of the country, to get involved. So when Chris said, look, I'm, I would like to follow this, this uh, politician, musician, uh, I was like, wow, you know, this is great. And, and I mean, he had already inspired a nation. We had seen him transform as a musician from, you know, singing happy songs, feel good songs to singing protest songs. And now, like Bobby famously says, the, the ghetto had come to the parliament. He was in parliament to implement the issues that he had spoken about. So I, I felt like this was a great opportunity to be part of, and I thank Chris and here we are five years, six years later, yeah. Christopher, I do have to say one of the things that the documentary and the trailer gets you from the beginning is that Bobby is not Bobby without Barbie. Um, <laughs> it, is, um, <laughs> it is Barack without Michelle, you know what I mean? Like it is, they are such a powerful force together. But I'm curious, um, listen, uh, if you came to me saying you wanted to make a documentary, I don't know where you're from. I would wanna know a lot more. Who did you have to convince first? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's the nature of them. They're incredibly welcoming. Um, if you go to their house, it's always full of people. And mm. there's always people in the garden and people coming and going. And that's just who they are. They're extremely welcoming and friendly people. I think they didn't know what Moses and I were going to do. I don't think they really recognised the fact that we would be um, stuck to them in various different ways for the next six years. And they sort of became familiar with it. And eventually, you know, particularly Moses became so much part of their lives, they didn't even notice the camera was there. But I just going back to what you were saying about Barbie, I mean, Barbie is an extraordinary woman. She's just incredible. I asked Bobby the other day, I said, where would you be without Barbie? And he said, I'd be in the ghetto as a musician, hanging out he wouldn't be where he is. And he knows that, you know, she really empowered him. She gives him strength. She gives him support. They're very much best friends. You know, if he needs to know something, he goes to her and versa versa. They are, we could easily have made the film, you know, and called it Bobby and Barbie. Um, because the more we spent time with Barbie, we just realized how intrinsic she is to the whole thing. And in Uganda, she is loved beyond you know, even people who are in the in the regime and oppose Bobby, no one ever has a bad word to say about Barbie. She she really is the first lady of Uganda. 
so well said too. And you really do feel that over the course of the documentary watching it because it takes a lot of twists and turns that I don't want to spoil for folks, but um, she is sometimes the narrator more than Bobby himself because of you know the incarceration and, and other aspects of the documentary that you get. Moses, when you set about with this documentary, I don't think you could have predicted the levels of trouble and, and violence and sort of risque moments that Bobby would be put in, but also you as the documentarian, a lot of times literally right alongside him as, as these horrific things are happening. How did you as a filmmaker sort of balance both making sure that you could create that cinema verite, but also being safe in a particularly a completely unsafe moment. And, and really, how did you guys keep that focus of wanting to tell the story, knowing all of these extreme things were happening around you? Um, it, it, it would have been very easy to give up, you know, cause I was arrested, you know, locked up in jail and interrogated, you know, I was shot in the face at close range um, and I mean, I was lucky. Uh, I didn't. I, I have not. Um, I have not undergone some of the violence. Some people, some uh, cameramen have 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 undergone because it increasingly became very uh, dangerous to follow Bobby and to be around him. But I must say, for me, it was really the story. The story and and what I was witnessing was extraordinary. Never in the history of our country had there been this kind of uprising that was happening in front of my eyes. So it was just a blessing to, to, to capture that moment and to be part of telling that story. Um, I mean, we were, we would always have to assess the situation with Christopher all the time. And, uh, you know, we supported each other through the moment, through those moments, through the process and yeah, but it, it was, uh, it was a roller coaster, you know. Uh, as we speak today, I I live in the U.S. because I'm here seeking political asylum. Mm -hmm. I cannot live in Uganda anymore. Um, of course, I didn't know this is where we would be when we started the project. But increasingly, knowing how important the story was uh, and how important the camera was, mainly to keep Bobby safe and the people around him, you know, I I continued the task. Um, but yes, I, I I am here seeking political asylum. I can't return to Uganda as we speak, but we are hopeful. We hope that you know the attention that this film receives will highlight the struggle back home and and the fight of the Ugandan people. It's so incredible. I mean, Chris, for you guys, when you when you set about the project, I don't know how long you guys thought that you would be following Bobby or whether you thought it would be five or six years, but at what point did you decide that you had to keep going? Because I'm sure there were moments where you were like, maybe we should, like what ended up sort of giving you what y'all decided was the bookends for this narrative? Because look, there's, there's long form documentaries that have happened over several different instances, but particularly with this instance there, as Moses said, there are moments when not just you could turn off, maybe you would want to for his safety, for your safety, for the practicality. How did you eventually decide these were going to be the bookends for, for where Bobby was? You know, there was moments when we thought Bobby had been killed. Um, there was moments when we thought they would keep him imprisoned. Um, you know, there was one particular time when he was terribly tortured. And I, you know, you have this pit in your stomach, both Moses and I, the whole time that this is going to end really badly. But it, we just knew we just had to keep going and we kept going. But after the election, it felt like it was the right moment to stop because the story is not over. Bobby, Barbie and those around them, they're going to keep going until they free Uganda. But that might take a while longer. And we felt at that point that the really important thing was to get this story out. Because many people in the West don't understand what happens in Uganda, and they see it as this sort of sort of democracy, which is a relatively stable country. But Moses and I knew that wasn't true. That's really not the true. And then in Bobby, you know, Africa has a hero. And this is a man who is putting his whole life at risk to bring democracy to Uganda. And we knew that story was important to get out as quickly as possible. And it will make a difference, you know, it can make a difference. If the government in Uganda stops unleashing violence on its own people, then there's a chance that there might eventually be a, a transition of power. So, so we felt that was the right moment to stop, get the story out and let the film 
do the talking and help the movement. Uh, Moses, another aspect of this, I love that Christopher mentioned that you became a part of the family um, because the family is a part of this story as much as Bobby, as much as Barbie, as much as his music. And I love that scene with his daughter where she's just like, because they have my father for no reason. Like, the, the political activism in this family, it just, it runs so deep and true, but that is a delicate thing, um, bringing children into this story because you might be, you know, to what Christopher said, you guys could have been documenting um, essentially a, 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 the last moments of, of him. And so it is, a, it is a difficult and difficult moment. How did you guys approach um, bringing the kids into the narrative? Because I can't imagine the film without them at this point. Yeah, so, you know, the access grew increasingly as we came close to the 2021 election. We started off in 2017 covering really the artists and, you know, the politicians. So it was mainly the politics in the beginning. But as the assassinations, the assassination attempts were happening when his driver was shot, you know, and we had amassed all this footage, actually, that's around the same time. Christopher and I decided to start editing the film. We, we really started editing Ali because we knew something might happen to this guy, right? And we needed to have something to put out and, you know, to put out to the world that this is what happened. Anyways, but the children are just, you know, it's just a wonderful family. It's just, you know, they welcomed me. And by the end of the filming, I had a place in their house. I could crash there anytime I wanted to. And the kids, continue to ask until this day what happened to uncle moses where is he you know but they're just so intelligent and wonderful um and those moments just came natural you know the kids are so aware of the situation you know they know their father is not doing anything illegal even if he's incarcerated it's because he's fighting for the good reasons so you know they've trained their kids their children are just so intelligent and and thoughtful you know um, and and again, uh, and this also highlights why Bobby is very important to the story. She's created the home like a sanctuary for Bobby, where he returns to be energized, you know. Um, and that that was an is you know incredible moments to to capture and, and and have. With so much as you see Bobby go through and what Barbie goes through, what their family goes through, what is the one of the more joyful moments for you about the production of this? Because that's where it starts. It starts with Bobby's joyful music, his love of his country, his love of his family that brings us to some of these horrific things that happen later. I'm curious for all of you, wh where is that joyful moment for y'all as filmmakers behind it? And I'll start with you, Christopher. I mean, for me, being with them, talking to them, hanging out with those two has just been worth every minute. And if we, you know, hadn't shot one single frame, but we'd had that opportunity to spend so much time with them, I would have taken it. They are just wonderful people. And to know them, to be with them, and we've become really, really good friends. Um, I mean, just going back to what you were saying about the children, just adding to what Moses said, I mean, we filmed it and then we showed Bobby and Barbie quite a late cut. And we showed it to them, not for them to change anything, because we didn't want them to have editorial input into the actual thing, because we were the storytellers, but just to make sure they were comfortable with the children's involvement and to make sure there was no one in the film who could be in danger. So, you know, and they said to us, you know, at the end, it's fine. And the kids at that point loved it because suddenly they were looking at themselves, you know, from sort of three, four years before. And they were like so excited and they were laughing. And, you know, I mean, it was very, very, very sweet. But just, I mean, being with them and also just knowing that we have supported people who are genuinely making a difference. And um, I mean, for me, Bobby is the most important African since Mandela. I, mm. I think he's a really, really special person who can not just change Uganda, I genuinely believe he can make a difference and set an example for the whole of Africa. I, mm. I think a lot of people, including myself or anyone who's seen the documentary would agree. Moses, for you, a particularly special moment of joy that you'll take from this? Wow, there's lots of moments, uh, regardless of the, you know, the, the heaviness of the film. And I must say, 
part of the reasons why we brought in the children was to make the film as light as possible because, you know, it was a heavy subject, uh, but the film is actually very hopeful. By the time you finish watching this film, you're energized, you know, you want to do something, you're inspired. And we do that with the music, but also the kids are a great part of that, you know, uh, Subi, uh, Shalom and Shadrach and, and Solomon, you know, they're just incredible kids and they bring that lightness to the story. Um, the most, I think, uh, joyful and, and happy moments, of course, uh, I, I will tell you this, even when we were being tear gassed or shot at or in those down moments, Bobby would make jokes in the car and we would laugh and, you know, we would still be hopeful and look forward to the next day. He's a very, he's a rare, a rare individual. They're just rare people, you know? So um, yeah, those were like the real joyful moments, you know, spending time in studio when he's creating, you know, himself, you know, Nubian Lee and, and all the people around him, you know? Um, yeah, he's just an incredible character. Let me just add one thing, you know, one time Chris, uh, Christopher asked, asked Bobby, why are you so forgiving? How are you so forgiving? Because, you know, people let him down so many times. But then he opens up to these people again. And he was like, look, in the ghetto, we have no hate, right? Like, because he grew up in the ghetto, you, you share everything. So he's this incredible individual who just opens himself up all the time. And I think that's a huge joy and, and thing to know. Yeah. I love that. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at one of, again, one of the more joyful moments from the documentary. Um, let's take a look, look right here. The word was out. Bobby Wine was being allowed home. A quick look to confirm it was him in the car. And then the last yards. Inside this vehicle, Bobby Wine returning home. The very fact that he's been allowed to come here is a big political victory for him and a moment of joy for his supporters. three decades of one man's rule. And in a country where three quarters of the population is under 35, the promise is intoxicating. Uh, Moses, talk about setting up that day, knowing you had literally, you know, half of Uganda outside his door, and you know you have to to capture this correctly. You're also trying to make sure Bobby's going to be okay. Um, talk about sort of setting that up, the filming of that day. Wow, that day was just interesting. I mean, the military had deployed all over the country. You know, there was so many Ugandans on the streets of of Uganda waiting to welcome Bobby right? They were lining the streets from the airport to his home, you know, all over the country. Um, people were so excited. People were so joyful, you know, as you see in the clip, you know, um, for the first time, he, he was coming back home from America after being tortured and going through uh, some medical checks, and he was coming back. So there was this, this joy of liberation, almost, you know, that, you know, our leader is back, you know, and we're going to make it, we're going to go through this, and, you know, and you can see the enthusiasm in the people, you know, and, and it, that day was, was, you know, not so many days like that, right, not so many days in the film, um, but yeah, just, I mean, um, yeah, I, I spent the day with Bobby at home and, and the kids as they prepared to welcome him, Bobby's supporters were, were surrounding the home, and, you know, they were just, you know, waiting for him, putting up placards and, and you know, planting trees on the on the side of the road. It was just an incredible sight to see. Yeah. 
I love that. Um, I wanted to ask both of you this because again, the, the film is bigger than the documentary. It's bigger than the awards it's getting. It's bigger than um, the folks that sort of got to see it. But there's one small moment that I'm sure you guys had, which is the very first time you showed the Bobby and Barbie and the family, the full film. And it's powerful and I'm sure it was emotional. I'd love for both of you to talk about um, what it was like showing it to them for the first time, how you felt on that day and sort of how, and what they sort of gave back. Cause you know, Rotten Tomatoes girl, I gotta know what the first reviews were. <laughs> well, it was great apprehension because I mean, someone did a review, I can't remember which reviewer it was. And they said, it feels like Bobby Wine had some editorial input into this film. And that was totally not true. He didn't have any editorial input into the film at all. So it was, so there was great apprehension showing it to him and just wondering, you know, how they'd feel, if they'd feel, you know, we'd done them justice. I think my biggest fear throughout this whole film is having given us this incredible access and being so generous with us and not asking questions, not asking what we're doing, not trying to restrict us. I was really worried that we'd let them down. You know, I was worried we'd make this film, it wouldn't get any attention. And I, I knew that Bobby and Barbie would be like, no, it's great, you know, you've done an amazing job, thank you so much, it's great. But it just not to have given the attention. So it was, you know, that was always the fear that it wouldn't get out there. And unfortunately, it really has got out there. And we're incredibly grateful to, you know, everyone who supported the film um, and all the sort of documentary makers who got behind it and realised that it matters. But when they watched it, they kind of liked it. They were like, their first thing was, you know, why didn't you show this? Why didn't you show that? And then Bobby famously said, why have you made Museveni look so good? <laughs> and, what, <laughs> and what he was, and we looked at him and we were like, what? And he was like, you've made him look good. You haven't shown, you know, a quarter of the violence. And, you know, that was an editorial decision because we did various cuts where there was a lot more violence, but it just felt overwhelming. You felt like you couldn't focus on the story. And we sort of ended up in the edit really focused on Bobby and Bobby and letting people see the pain of Uganda through them. But generally, I mean, they, they were happy. Yeah, they were really happy. Moses, anything to add to that for you, sir? I'm um, showing it to them for the first time. No, Chris has put it very correctly, yeah. Well, then I'll ask you the last question. There's hopes when you sat down to do a film like this. You hope that it helps people bring attention to what's going on in Uganda. You hope that people get to know Bobby, you get to know his family. If there's one thing that you can encourage folks for why they should one, seek out this documentary and what they should do afterwards, because I'm firmly of the belief you can't watch this and not feel like you need to do something afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, what is your hopes for that? Um, firstly, um, we, we are so honored and with lots of gratitude by the attention the film has gotten and where it's gotten, you know, we did not dream of being here. You know, when when I was in Uganda filming this, I I was focused on the day, on the events, you know, trying to go through that day, trying to 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 finish that moment, whatever was happening, you know, the chaos and all that. That's what preoccupied my mind. We didn't think of where we are today. So it's a great honor to be here and we, you know, we are grateful to all the supporters we've gotten, all the support we've gotten this far. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it not only, you know, it goes so far to help uh, the revolution back home, to help uh, and to shine attention on, on those fighting for democracy and the voices of the voiceless Ugandans, you know, um, some whom we do not know where they are until today. There's people who have been missing until now as we speak, you know, and and we we don't take this attention lightly. So every attention that this film receives highlights the need to fight for democracies, right? We hope that people who see this film will understand that they need to protect their democracies as well. Uh, because as much as yes, we cover this 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 terrible situation in Uganda, but you see that the people are hopeful, you see that the people need change. Um, and resilient, right? But we've never had a democracy in Uganda. So we hope that those who have their democracies will protect them, those in the West and many other countries. 
Um, I think Chris has a few points that he would add to this. No, I mean, you've said it. I, I think, you know, I, I think that's exactly it. This is not the end of the story. Um, yeah. There might be an awful long way to go, but I, the, hopefully the film will help to bring democracy in Uganda. I mean, we had, you know, uh, Bobby won't say this, but, you know, you feel that he's been slightly let down by us, by us, I mean, us in the West, you know, they've continued, we have continued, <laughs> I can say that, we have continued to support the government in Uganda, you know, money pours in from America, from Europe, from England. Um, and it's, you know, a lot of the money is used against the, the people of Uganda. So we hope, we hope that it influences that. And also the other thing, which I always felt very strongly, is it's so nice for Africa to have a hero. You know, in Bobby and Barbie, they've got heroes. And for me, you know, there there's not many people in the whole world who are as heroic as those two are. So it's kind of wonderful that, you know, they they own them. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, when I spoke to them on the Oscars carpet, they said they were looking forward to seeing the new Bob Marley film. And I was like, well, from the Bob Marley of Africa, that's that's very fitting. So thank you all very much. I want to, again, thank you all for watching and remind you that you can now see Bobby Wine, the People's President, streaming on Disney Plus and online. And it is available for voting in all in the documentary category. Thank you so much.